The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sencher, near the point of ground where Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, asks a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews did not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it was who was saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, You have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and his sons and flocks who drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give them will become like a spring of water, gushing up, to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may never be thirsty or have to be coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go and call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus told her, You are right in saying you have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you're with now is not your husband. What have you say is true, the woman said to him. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We know what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, it is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came, and they were astonished that he was speaking to a woman, but no one said, what do you want, or why do you speak to her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see the man who told me everything I'd ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and went on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him anything to eat. And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months and the reaper is ready to receive his wages and then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and you'll see the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is ready to receive his wages and is gathering for the fruit of eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying it holds true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap, but you did not labor. Others have labored and have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So the Samaritan came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his words. 
They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. We have now heard for ourselves, and we know that it is true, the Savior of the world. My friends, the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. A couple years ago, I read a book called Deep Blue. It was written by an evangelical writer. It probably isn't the greatest spiritual reading that, that I've ever had. It, it, it was good, and he was, he was honest, though. And something in the honesty kind of caught me, just the way he used uh, kind of cultural references, and he was trying to kind of work through this whole thing. What is faith? And sometimes you can read a whole book for just one line. And the line that has always stayed with me was this sort of honest depiction of what it's like to try to express faith. He said that, you know, when I write about Christianity, it always sounds trite, cliche. It never really seems to have that authenticity that I'm, I'm, I'm reaching for. But when I experience faith, when I experience people of faith, there's just no mistaking it. And there's a joyfulness and a healing that comes from that encounter. And I always thought that was just a really honest insight into how hard it is to capture some of the things we're trying to capture. We use words that we, we hold in common, words like grace and love and healing, redemption, and, and I don't think we would argue about sort of what their base meaning is. But what is it to evangelize? Something as basic as that. What is it to be an evangelist? Discipling. And the task that I have this morning, which is trying to express what is it to be in a personal relationship with Christ? We all know the words. Let me ask you a question. Have you made Jesus Christ your personal Savior and Lord? Like that's almost a catchphrase that we hear in evangelical circles. I don't think anyone's surprised by that phrasing. But what does it mean? And how do you talk about it without sounding cliche? Or falling back onto those same sort of phrases that, that we sort of hold in common, but we're not really sure of, of what, it, what it's supposed to be. As I was reflecting on this talk and, and, and what I would want to say, I thought I would draw from um, a teaching that I, I first heard with Catholic Christian Outreach, CCO. So in many ways, they're kind of on the front lines of this, working in universities with students. And they've come up with a fairly simple little model. It's the three circles. Some of you, I'm sure, have heard it. But I think it touches this in, in a very succinct way. They talk about stages that a person might go through. In the first stage, there's a circle, and I'm the center of my circle. And in this circle with me are, are some things. My family, my studies, my experience, my friends, my hobbies. You can imagine what might be in here. Sadly, for many people of this generation, Deacon Bob spoke into this, faith isn't one of those things. Not in the immediate circle. Oh, it's out there, the notion of it, the, the words, the, some of the symbols. But I'm in the center of my circle and my things are here with me. And I think all of us can probably relate to that in some way. If not in our own phase of our lives, then certainly people that we know. Faith just doesn't seem to be a part of, of, of what they, they see and what they hold to be important and true. Now the second circle is, is, is something a little closer to, to what we experience. I'm still the center of the circle, but in here with me is faith. But faith as one part of many. I've still got family. I've still got friends. I've still got my school. I've still got my own history, my own stories, my own stuff. Faith is just one element of many. And that probably describes many of us. Now, it's better than not at all. 
but it still hasn't really got to where we need to go. As we were sharing in our, our uh, group yesterday at, at the table, you could almost see the glass ceiling here. We want to get to that next level, but we're not sure how to describe it. We're not even sure how to phrase it. But simply having faith as part of our lives doesn't seem to be enough. And as I was reflecting on it, I was thinking, you know, part of it, I think, is who's still in the center of the circle. I'm still in the center of the circle. And so if I see my faith as something that still is of some benefit to me, I've used this before, you know, if, if faith in God and, and practice of my religion and, and connecting with other people somehow just benefits me, it's sort of been reduced to good dental hygiene. You know, it's, it's nice, but no one really does it. It'd probably benefit me somehow, but who really takes the time? Then there is not that transformative power that's going to make a difference and penetrate our wider culture. Because as many people look at this, they, they simply don't see the benefit. Why should I do this? Why should I be a part of it? Why should I get up on Sunday morning? Why should I have to change the way I live for some potential concept that I don't really know much about and frankly don't want to know? But what we've been describing as an ideal is something more. Is to move from this state, where I'm still the center of the circle, to where Christ becomes the center of the circle. And I am one of the elements in our Lord's circle. That's an apostle. Having been so transformed and so moved by my relationship with Jesus Christ, that I no longer find the attraction. I don't need to be the center anymore. Now that sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Did I just fall into a cliche again? Because I think if we're honest, for a modern person, that's a terrifying reality. I'm no longer in control. I'm no longer the center of things. I'm no longer the one calling the shots. Or as the commercialism would put it, I can't have it my way. And it terrifies us. And so we jump back into circle number two and say that's good enough. But it isn't good enough. And I don't think it's what God called us to be. You see, what we have to lose in circle three is not ourselves. We will not be obliterated. We'll be set free. I don't have to run the universe. I don't have to run the church. I don't even have to run me. I'm going to let Christ do that. Now we are terribly close to quoting a country and western tune. <laughs> Jesus, take the wheel. And I asked Eric yesterday if that was possible to play that kind of as a conclusion of our, our time together. He respectfully declined. <laughs> Wisely. And again, do you see the cliché? Jesus, take the wheel. And yet, beneath the cliché is a truism. To quote, if not Carrie Underwood, then I'll quote uh, Dr. Phil. For those of you who have been driving your own car for a very long time, how's that working for you? Are we getting anywhere? Is it working? Or as our table we discussed yesterday, how much do we really have to lose? How much do we really have to gain? Do we want to be set free? Do we want to experience a transcendence and a joy and a peace wherever that takes us? I wanted to share with you as a witness a story where I think I finally came to understand this. And there are a lot of stories I could tell you of good moments in my life, of happy times, of successful relationships and, and ministry and, and beautiful sunny days. We'll save that for another time. This is not one of those stories. This is probably one of those difficult times and maybe one of the more difficult in my adult life. 
Some of the priests have heard this before. I used it as an, I think it was a Lenten reflection one time. But I just wanted to share with you. Just a little over three years ago, uh, the context is important, and I'll try to be short with it. My father passed away quite suddenly. I was on a trip with the bishop in Rome, the year of the priests. And it happened at a particularly difficult time because I was just finishing my time at St. Michael's and we're being transferred to, to the Holy Trinity Pastoral Unit in, in Lower Sackville. And so in the course of one week, I had to do three hard things. I had to bury my father, move, and start a new job. To say any one of those is, is difficult, I had to do all three in one week. And partly because of that, I think, um, I didn't have much time to grieve. We did the funeral, we got on with it, and as being a man, I, I, I buried it. Now, unfortunately, this death occurred just six months shy of my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. So we'd already begun preparation for that, my siblings and myself, and so as we got into September, into October, about this time, we realized next month we had a party, but there's one person who's not going to be there. What do you do? My brothers were very good. They said, well, you go home and you be with your family. That's what you do. And so I'd booked a flight home. But as those things happen sometimes, it just, just before I left, there had been something we were working on in the parish, and it kind of blew up in my face. It was not a good day. I think the um, euphemism would be an actively disengaged parishioner <laughs> who basically handed me my head some of which I have to own, but it was not a good day. In fact, it would have been probably one of the hardest days I've ever faced. It was just a very, very difficult meeting that did not end well. So as I got on that plane to fly home, I wasn't so sure. It's not that I didn't think I was coming back. I was just having a hard time thinking of why I'd want to. When I got there, everybody needs a, a good friend. I had a priest pick me up at the airport in Ottawa, and I was driving home the next day, and he's kind of like, what did you step in? And, and so it was kind of a, it was, it was a little bit of ministry time. But the next day I woke up still wondering, why am I doing this? Why would anybody want to do this? In a query of a bunch of events that happened that morning, he had a funeral. I was going to borrow the second car. There was a dead battery. We had to switch plans last minute. Kind of a whirlwind of jackets and coats and this and that and make this decision, he left in a kind of a bit of a dust storm and, and I was left alone for a couple hours in the house and, and that's fine, I wasn't in a rush. But in the course of all that event, he had taken out of his pockets a number of things that, from funerals, one of which was my father's funeral card from the funeral just four months before. And so as I walked around the kitchen, I'd come encounter with my picture of my dad, which was not what I was ready to see. And this was a bit of a crisis for me. One, that I had to grieve something that I hadn't really fully grieved yet. And two, at the moment I felt God was using his omnipotent power not to convert or to heal, but to paint me into a corner. And there was some bitterness in that. Are you appeased? Is this what you want for me, for the church, for my family? Is this what it is to be a follower and disciple of Jesus Christ? And I prayed probably the most earnest prayer I've prayed in a very long time. And it was a little emotional. And I was kind of glad I was alone and had some time. But after that had passed, there was some quiet. And for me in that moment, I felt I heard something. Now, I think the Lord can speak in many, many ways. I'm not trying to suggest this is the only way God communicates. In fact, I'm beginning to believe that as many as there are people on this planet, the Lord has ways of speaking to us. But I've been in a practice of keeping a prayer journal, and I've done that for 25 years. And so for me, this came in a, a voice, not what I heard, but a, a language that was in my heart. And I felt that the Lord said to me, I love you, I love you, I love you. I'm not going to promise you some great glory in the future because you can't hear that right now. But it's true. What I'm asking of you 
is that you will stay at the foot of the cross when everyone else runs away. Only a fool would do this. Will you be my fool? Will you be a fool for Christ? Now, I've shared this before, and it kind of came with a great sense of relief. First time in my priesthood, I actually had a job description. <laughs> a fool for Christ. Now, I wasn't sure if I was even going to share that until yesterday, but I just wanted to break it down just very, very briefly. You see, I think when we're talking about a personal encounter with Christ, it's personal. That's the point. Those first three words, I love you, I love you, I love you. It wasn't a, a love for the church. It wasn't a love for creation or priesthood or even people who are struggling, although all those are true. I love you. The Lord loves me. Not for what I do, not for what I achieve, not for whatever insight I might have. He simply loves me. And he tells me that three times. And he doesn't want to cut a deal. He's not saying, look, if you just put up with this for another 15, 20 years, you'll get an upgrade when you get to heaven. <laughs> and he wasn't in some sort of belligerent way saying, you think you got it bad? Let me show you half the world that doesn't even have food to eat. No. He acknowledged that this is hard. And he didn't try to play on that. And then the insight. This is the whole point. You see, you weren't supposed to change the world. And you weren't supposed to reform the church. And I'm the one who's redeeming it. I just asked you to stay with me. Now who's in the center of the circle? In his act of redemption, my role is, is passivity. To remain with him in case there's a need. Am I willing to, to fulfill that role? Jesus is in the center. Happily, I'm not. Only a fool would do this. Will you be my fool? And this is the part that kind of, and those of you who know me a little better, I have this rather twisted sense of humor. And this plays, of course, perfectly into it. I, I find this, in a dark way, very, very amusing. That he would, in his creativity, use our characteristics of who he created us to be to communicate back to us who he is. It's that personal, that intimate. They would use a touch of irony and a, and a twist of phrase to communicate his love for me. Perfect. That's the third circle. Now, do I spend all of my time there? I wish. Are there times I've stepped back into another one? Yes. But like my author friend, you see, I have a hard time communicating that even to you orally. But when I experienced it, there was no question what was happening there for me. And something broke, and I was able to grieve properly and get on with the business of discipling. Now, I hope that made some sense to you. And I apologize if it's a little too personal, but that's what we're aiming for. Because once you've had that kind of experience, and once you've been that close, and once he's actually broken through, not always on the bright sunny days, sometimes maybe the hardest moment you ever face in your life, but those are the things that we draw from. It's really not for me to recreate that somehow or try to kind of one-up it. It's to draw from it and to have more compassion for others that are going through it. And if these are the things we can communicate and support with each other, I, I think we're well on our way. So my dear friends in Christ, as we spend a little bit more time with the Lord, what we're going to do is maybe a little time of quiet, We'll have a, a simple benediction. You'll be invited to, this is a little different because this workshop's in two locations. Just spend some time with them. But he has eternity. We have about 20 minutes. <laughs> As you're ready, maybe to make your way to 
the hall. We're going to have coffee and, and just maybe a little, uh, little bite, a little snack for you. Um, you can go outside. You don't have to go through the hallway. Maybe ones and twos. We don't all have to go at the same time. But about quarter two, we want to be back and ready to continue on our sharing. So we said yesterday there's 240 of us. 250. So I'm thinking there's a probably about 250 things the Lord wants to say. And 250 things, people, sorry, that he wants to say them to. Let's make that little act of the will. Say, Lord, you be the center. You take the will. You be my Savior. Amen?